Welcome to Talking Tuesday. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today I am really excited to welcome Melind Sharma, one of the great experts here on quantum mental finance. So just quick background, I could spend probably, I don't know, hours talking about Melind and his experience and expertise here, but CEO of Quant Z Intelligent Machines, Quant Z Capital Management. Um, again, we're going to talk about this in the interview here in a second. Uh, past history is a director in global arbitrage and trading at RBC Capital Markets, a director and senior prop trader at Deutsche Bank, a background in education in Carnegie Mellon as one of the first quant finance student grads out of that program, which we're going to talk about as well. Also the president and founder of Quaffa New, so a New York club for quants to kind of network, talk, relax, unwind, and do quanty things. Uh, we're going to talk about that towards the end of this interview as well. But without further ado, let's welcome Melind. Well, thank you, Dimitri. Uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, Melind Sharma here, Quanzi. Most of you know me as either Quanzi or Quaffinia, so. <laughs> so. So, Melind, why don't you just give us a quick introduction of your background, just quickly your education, your work experience. I know it's pretty deep here, but just kind of a high-level view. Absolutely. And again, thank you uh, for the opportunity to address your audience, Dimitri. Um, I've been in the quant space now, uh, at least, uh, you know, this sort of uh, in the industry for just over 25 years now. And, uh, you know, we were just talking about Peter Carr. So I was fortunate to show up in New York about the same time as our dear departed, uh, uh, the incredible and amazing uh, professor Peter Carr uh, had uh, showed up at Morgan Stanley from from uh, Cornell and I had uh, just, you know, come in from Pittsburgh, uh, Carnegie Mellon. So just to kind of go back uh, and sort of reverse chronology on the education side, I was actually uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Well, uh, I, I was, uh, well, I, I guess maybe I should do it more in forward chronology, that'd be more logical. So I, I was, you know, I had managed to publish some stuff in astronomy when I was in boarding school in Canada and I always thought I was gonna be an astronomer. And as it turns out, uh, for various reasons, you know, uh, well, uh, actually, uh, scholarship reasons. I mean, I got into some good places uh, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, Brown and Cornell, which would have been awesome for astronomy, but I couldn't uh, get a scholarship there. As it turns out, the other place I got in uh, Oxford was also my dream school. So I said, well, that's wonderful, but I, I also did, didn't have much funding there. So um, I got a nice deal worked out with Vassar, where basically I did, uh, you know, the uh, Oxford moderations in, uh, in, in philosophy of mathematics. And then I finished, uh, the rest of my degree at Vassar, uh, with a minor in physics, but you know, the, the, and philosophy really, but like all, all the physics, unfortunately kind of fell by the wayside. I did manage to get another paper out and, on, on the extra galactic distance scale and sort of quickly pivoted in the direction of philosophy of math, foundational stuff, set theory, things like that. Um, got into a few PhD programs, uh, and landed up at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about this, but like the reason I actually went there is because the year I started in 1994 is when they had just started the uh, uh, computational finance program. And when I was on campus and, you know, uh, uh, talking to uh, Steve Shreve and all these people, there was a lot of excitement about this new program. And none of the other math departments, which were, I mean, as it turns out, I mean, Carnegie Mellon is one of the only places in the world, actually, it's basically like Oxford, Berkeley and Carnegie that do this sort of uh, joint program in logic or uh, kind of the intersection of philosophy and math, which is, you know, which was my uh, dream. And uh, so it was the perfect place for me to be. Dana Scott, you know, Herb Simon, all, all the greats, you know, I mean, for people now, now that people uh, know all about AI, I mean, 1954 logic theorist, that was uh, Herb Simon. That's where, you know, that's how AI began and you know i mean originally actually most people don't know this but the what's now called the tepper school of business was uh, started as a school of management science i mean herb simon is really the pioneer of management science and uh he got his uh, Nobel for satisfying and whatnot but you know it was the beginnings of this sort of very quanti um uh, kind of um, uh, business education right so it in fact the degree used to be called not an mba but uh, an msia which was a bit unusual. Um, so it was a super geeky school. And I, I, I love that fact that there was this sort of potential hedge built in that if, you know, uh, um, math didn't go anywhere, maybe I could uh, get a job in the industry. And uh, so I started just kind of taking classes, you know, slid in sideways into the program while I was doing my 
um, you know, my uh, uh, computational logic uh, stuff, which actually back then AI meant things like autonomous theorem proving. That's what I was working on is actually uh, like an automated theorem prover in Lisp. And um, other folks at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon were doing very exciting stuff that's now all public domain commercialized. Things like your, you know, first driverless car had already been done in 89. And in fact, there was a gentleman who drove it across the country in 95. So it was a very exciting time. There was, there was crazy innovation going on. You know, first uh, your, your speech recognition, voice recognition, driverless cars, all of these great things. Mars Lander, there were so many amazing things happening on campus. and. Unfortunately, it was also the AI winter. So uh, interestingly, NSF was cutting their funding for you know very theoretical stuff like what I was doing. And uh, um, you know, um, as I mentioned, I was fortunate to sort of uh, start taking uh, the courses in in computational finance in the fall of '94 itself uh, when I got on campus, and then I started TAing for. Uh, the gentleman, Sanjay Srivastava, who's the, the guy who started the program with Steve Shreve. And so Sanjay was uh, uh, kind enough to let me sort of uh, TA for, for his Fast Lab. Um, now, this was a big deal back then, which, by the way, it's uh, the Fast Lab is now in the Smithsonian. So uh, the Fast Lab was like the first kind of simulated uh, trading floor. And uh, you have to bear in mind the internet barely existed, okay? So <laughs> in 1994, <laughs> five, the internet wasn't really a thing. It was uh, a, a node at uh, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford and Urbana and maybe at CERN. So I think there was four, four. That was the entirety of the World Wide Web <laughs> or thereabouts. So actually doing a simulated trading session jointly with Tokyo was a tremendous uh, feat of uh, engineering. Uh, we, oh, had to have a, we had to have a satellite dish parked outside, uh, you know, uh, uh, GSI, the, what's now called Tepper, uh, communicating with, with Tokyo. And, you know, I mean, we, we were uh, obviously computers very slow back then. It was like P IBM PCs and 80s and XTs and whatever. And, you know, um, so it was really kind of an exciting time to be making that switch into uh, in, into computational finance. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, it sort of worked out. They let me jump ship, and you know, I was I always had in the back of my mind that if you if you're gonna sell out, you might as well just go all the way to the business school, right? Why stop in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna go from philosophy and sell out, <laughs> you might as well just go to the business school. Um, so, so but, what made you uh, decide to go into that realm? I mean, this for us today, right? We all know what quantitative finance is. There's lists of schools and topics online, but you know, coming back in '95 this new program's kind of just stemming out of this. Was it just out of pure curiosity or like what was the, the driver for you? Um, no, thank you. Well, as, as I mentioned, I'd already started taking the classes in 94 and then started TAing for the program. So I was TAing the Fast Lab, the, you know, um, and, and sometimes actually sleeping in the Fast Lab. That was my third office. I had that because I was in the other program. I had an office in Math Department and CS, but my other... Uh, office uh, was was in the fast lab and so you know I was sort of often pulling all nighters in the fast lab but uh, um, actually the way well, what really happened is when I was finishing undergrad and I knew that I was completely unemployable <laughs> I had no idea you know I had not tried to take any really useful courses like I, I didn't have any courses at econ or finance or anything but uh, I just randomly uh, I did have a near perfect GPA and I had some pretty good academic credentials and some papers in astronomy and whatnot. So I went and interviewed randomly with BlackRock, you know, firms like that. But now at the time, BlackRock was uh, uh, about 30 people uh, uh, in a small office, in, you know, uh, 235 Park Avenue. So it wasn't actually that prestigious a job. In fact, it was more like who are these people? I mean, it's a, they're very smart. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a curious place. I mean, you got this MIT PhD and like these really sharp people running the place and uh, what the hell do they do? And they, they were nice enough to actually entertain some random math major who didn't know anything about, you know, anything. And, and I just told them up front, look, I mean, I, I don't know stocks from bonds, but if you <laughs> still want to talk to me and they were very happy to talk to me. So... <laughs> I mean, that's actually kind of how it used to work. I mean, I think maybe it's gotten a lot more specialized now because undergrads are even doing, you know, I, I know that Shreve has an undergrad program in BSCF now. So probably a lot of places and maybe Michigan does too, you might know, but 
Um, you know, it's gotten much more specialized where undergrads actually have useful skills. Many of them are learning Python programming and, you know, and, and they actually know a stock from a bond. Probably most of them are trading cryptos these days. <laughs> Robin Hood. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I was I was deliberately trying to just learn the very pure stuff. Like, okay, let's do lambda uh, calculus. You know, uh, uh, let's learn a little bit about Brownian motion and things of that nature. Things that are hard to do in real life once you get out, right? Because I mean, philosophy, uh, or I should say, like you know, things things like history, or there are things that are maybe easier to learn on your own but there are things that are not so easy to learn unless you're taught. And I would say that uh, Brownian motion is one of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, stochastic calculus, unless, unless you have a really good teacher like Steve Freeman who makes it very interesting because it's such a dry subject that, um, you know, you, even the most gifted mathematicians have trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, in, the, in the early years, and the, you may find this interesting, um, uh, when, when, when did you finish your program? I'm curious. Uh, uh, 2014. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, um, you, you know, in the, in the early years, um, at least at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I think at the other places too, I mean, uh, there was a bit of a uh, very different focus. So when, when they started the program, they thought they were going to be training career changers. Um, you know, people who were, because uh, <clears throat> there was a kind of a surplus of, uh, uh, physicists who'd been maybe, uh, you know, who were uh, underemployed because the superconducting super collider had shut down. There were some massive projects that had been defunded by the NSF back then. And so there were some really smart people, not to mention a lot of Soviet physicists were driving cabs in New York at the time, if you recall. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there was just this huge sort of brain drain that had occurred. There were a lot of really smart people coming out of the science, especially because the whole thing and, you know, the superconducting super collider and trying to get retrained, right? So, I mean, they were trying to figure out what to do. And a lot of them, all of a sudden, it, it just happened like, oh, Wall Street wants you. And so this thing just happened like practically overnight um, where we were trying to create a niche. I mean, I remember when I was talking to firms and going to uh, the risk conferences and stuff and randomly got an offer when I wasn't even interviewing, um, but, you know, it happened because the derivatives market exploded, right? So it was very similar to what you witnessed today with cryptos and whatnot, right? That there, there was this insatiable demand. There was this huge source of new innovation, like this new product class that all these exotics were flourishing and, the, you know, and then the derivatives were exploding and nobody knew how to price them. Yeah. So um, actually, that's really what happened is I wasn't looking for a job at the time in the fall of 96, but basically... Um, I went to the risk conference uh, at the Hyatt here in New York and uh, sort of that led to multiple job offers just because, you know, I was walking around talking to Bankers Trust and Chase and uh, all these firms and, uh, you know, and, and they needed people who could price exotics. And we were amongst the very few who had a degree or some clue, mm -hmm. some qualification and, you know, just being able to do that. Um, so actually, that's a good segue into uh, how I landed up in the industry, because uh, <clears throat> walking around the risk conference, I got a few offers. And one of them that was actually the most interesting was the most unusual one, because, <clears throat> you know, normally, as you know, one goes into a sort of a uh, associate training program or something. You go to the bank and they tell you the stock from bond and this and that, right? And then you figure out what well, you do some rotation or something. Um, now, at the time, people didn't really know what to do with us because they didn't really, I mean, there were a lot of smart people from the IVs and whatnot, right? Like there were definitely lots of smart people in Wall Street, but they were not mathematicians. Mm -hmm. that, that was almost unheard of. So there were maybe two or three on a given trading floor. You might have had one. I mean, actually, you have some outliers, right? Like you had folks like Fisher Black and Emmanuel Durman at Goldman. You had some real big wigs, but there were not a ton of you know, random quants like myself, right? Like just smart guys, but not, you know, not Fisher Black, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a bit 
It's right. Like you, you had, you had some, some of these real, you know, Nobel laureate type of guys sitting at Goldman and then, and most other banks didn't have anything and they, they didn't even know what to do with the quant. They were, well, where do you need a quant? What the hell is all this stuff? Well, what, are you, what are you talking about? We trade futures. We, we, we've never heard of any of the stuff you're talking about. Like what are these theorems that, you know, <laughs> they're proving with stochastic calculus. Why do you need that? So, um, but you know, what actually really kind of, I think, um, <clears throat> made this whole thing explode is that, you know, initially we were kind of um, sort of a, you know, a hammer looking for a nail, right? Like, okay, where's the demand going to come from? And she was like, well, there's all these derivatives that need to be priced. So we're going to take all the, you know, um, PhD X faculty types and retrain them. And actually the very first year they had six students, I believe all of them had PhDs. Um, you know, or two of them were even three of them maybe were ex-faculty or something, postdoc ex-faculty from, you know, places like uh, MIT and Urbana and whatever. So all, all smart people who were looking to get retrained. Um, <clears throat> and then what, what happened is that, you know, the derivatives demand did explode. And pretty soon um, there were a bunch of scandals where people lost money. And I'm sure you remember... Uh, all these types of scandals like Procter and Gamble, Gibson Greetings, you know, um, actually Orange County happened around this time. So it might've been 95, I think. Uh, Orange County filed for bankruptcy and, uh, you know, uh, the treasurer, Robert Citrone was a client of Merrill Lynch, my former old mother. And, you know, it was a big scandal. And that's when a lot of banks got serious and they said, you know, we, we got to price these things properly. We need risk management. Um, so I'll, I'll get into those two things uh, uh, separately. One is, you know, the losses that led to the creation of kind of a mandate for risk, which shockingly okay. did not exist till the mid nineties. You would you would have thought that every I mean, like looking back today, right? It seems kind of ludicrous that most <laughs> banks and even asset managers didn't have any risk management. But when I showed up at Merrill Lynch in nineteen ninety seven, that was their first considered effort to have risk on the buy side. Okay, there was no formal role. There was no chief risk officer at Merrill Lynch Asset Management in 1997. I was hired as part of an effort to create the whole risk function. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, even before that, I, I, I did a brief stint to Ernst & Young, and that was actually the most fascinating job, really, at the time, because, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, with, with a lot of this derivative stuff has kind of uh, gone by the wayside now. Right, so nobody's really pricing exotics anymore. But um, at at the time, there was this insatiable demand because uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know a lot of firms were trading uh, crazy stuff. I mean, Bankers Trust made its name and reputation on LIBOR cute swaps and all kinds of you know newfangled products. That looking back again, you wonder why would anybody want to trade all these ratchets, cliques, whispers you know, passport options. And I mean, the stuff that really the mathematicians love to price and it, it, it made for a lot of good PhD theses and academics uh, loved it. They got into the game, but um, yeah, eventually it all blew up and now we say, oh, well, why on earth did anybody trade that OTC? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great point because I think you hit it perfectly when the risk is starting to take off on the buy side. Um, I started my career in 2014, 2014, and that was when CCAR and the whole Dodd-Frank, DFAS, everything hit. And again, even so now you're talking risk managers at the big banks. A lot of the small banks never had any of those CROs or any of those positions. And then that kind of pushed a second wave into more of the sell side for just traditional banking, not even the investing side of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, it's it's uh, it is interesting how this industry has evolved, and of course, look, it's gotten much more. You know, it's clearly more mature now, and unfortunately, a lot of that excitement of uh, of the early days of derivatives pricing and you know going to him. And I actually uh, met Peter first at that uh, infamous risk conference where there were probably like three thousand people packed into the Hyatt. I mean, those were. Uh, the days when, you know, Risk Magazine and the Risk Conference was huge, right? It was like mm -hmm. a real kind of who's who of all the big brains would show up. And actually, I mean, the kind of the quality of uh, path breaking um, 
uh, papers being presented at a risk industry conference may, may have far exceeded anything you would have seen in academia. So it was really kind of an amazing time in history looking back. I mean, maybe, you know, we'll see some such innovation in DeFi or some other, uh, you, you know, some, some of these other newfangled things that are coming about. But uh, clearly, a lot of, you know, TradFi has gotten somewhat commoditized, right? So you're not seeing that type of innovation. And even in the late 90s when, um, I mean, uh, actually the reason I took the job at, at uh, Ernst & Young is because it was such an unusual situation where, you know, for, uh, for a kid with no experience and no knowledge of anything, I mean, just because I knew how to price all these exotics, they gave me the chance to build the first derivatives pricing engine and, and, and you know, kind of uh, run this little uh, research group and basically sit in the middle of the, you know, so Ernst Young has a very special capacity because uh, uh, at the time it was big six, but they had eight out of 12 derivative subsidiaries that they were certifying. Now, the way these wow. derivative uh, swap codes used to work is that, you know, um, <clears throat> Yeah, they, they were credit enhanced vehicles. So in, in order to do a uh, to do a swap um, or, or to trade these exotic derivatives, you really wanted a AAA rating. So the bank had to create a subsidiary, right? And that swap code would then sort of uh, be the counterparty. So you didn't want to directly face Lehman or Bankers Trust, but you would face Lehman DP or you'd face Bankers Trust DP. And my job was to certify all of these DPs but you see, the beauty of the job was that because I had to face all the DPs, I sat, I got to sit in the middle and see all their models. Now, there's no other job in Wall Street where you could actually see if you were sitting at Lehman, you didn't know how Bankers Trust was pricing that exotic. Or if you're sitting at BT, you didn't know what uh, JP was doing. But because I was sitting in the middle, I knew everybody's models, right? And better still, I, they had to cooperate with me. They had to help me validate their price independently up to two decimal places. So uh, th that, put, that put me in a very strategic situation in this sort of hub and spoke model where basically, you know, uh, I, I not only get to create the derivatives pricing engine, but, you know, sort of see how every, uh, all, all these smart people at the various uh, derivative uh, subsidiaries were doing it. So anyway, uh, that, that's a bit of a digression, but the point is that that sort of thing is what made it all take off. Now, eventually, um, you know, uh, and during the credit crisis, some of this came home to roost when many of the uh, these these type of exotic trades really soured. But now I'm like kind of going a bit, uh, jumping ahead a little bit because uh, if one were to do this a bit more chronologically, you kind of had the whole derivatives uh, wave cresting and then it was more risk management because of all the losses and you know as I mentioned I mean um, uh, Merrill got serious about it in 97 because there was a mortgage trader that had actually hidden some tickets and uh, what was it uh, Javi Rubin um, and so they lost uh, you know 300 million which doesn't seem like a lot of money these days but um, <laughs> it was enough that they had to you know they had to uh, sell South Tower and uh, <clears throat> lease it back. And so they got serious about risk management um, as a result of that in 97. And uh, so the other banks did pretty soon. And then, you know, the, the, the um, uh, BIS requirement requirements and VAR and all that stuff started happening around the same time. So uh, there was actually a lot of uh, innovation on the risk side. And uh, I have to say that the programs, you know, were very responsive in modifying their curriculum. So uh, you know, I, I spoke to at least, uh, you know, certainly with Carnegie Mellon, I was in touch with them quite a bit and Sanjay immediately pivoted and started adding courses and risk and training guys to that. A few years later, I said, you know what, <laughs> this is, looks like the buy side's taking off. So <laughs> this is hard for people that believe today, maybe a lot of quants may not appreciate this, but, <clears throat> you know, in the nineties, they used to be a real sort of, uh, caste system, I mean, a hierarchy between the level of sophistication between, between the sell side and the buy side. So the smart quants, the really high powered quants were kind of sitting in the sell side. Mm -hmm. And the buy side was not quite the widows and orphans, but they were sort of, you know, maybe not as sophisticated, right? And then right. over 
those things uh, kept blowing up, then they got really smart and they started hiring their own PhDs. They said, well, wait a second, shouldn't we have smarter people than the ones who are selling us stuff? Because obviously, you know, you shouldn't trust what uh, any sales would have. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually changed pretty dramatically at some point where it went from, you know, the sell side being um, kind of more sophisticated and pulling a fast one to, over time, the buy side became much more sophisticated. And now, of course, the, I think the center of gravity has moved pretty dramatically to, you know, not just the asset managers, but actually to the hedge funds, right? So it really kind of went from, oh, wait, we're the big asset management companies, right? We're Malam and Fidelity and PIMCO. We need to have our own smart people. And so they hired tons of PhDs. And then over time, it became like, well, so now the hedge funds that spun out of those uh, places, they, they ended up sucking out the, you know, uh, the deepest talent uh, and, and kind of the cream of the crop. And so that's sort of how it went over time. <clears throat> right. So do you want to talk a little bit about your experience here? Because you went from Ernst & Young to Merrill Lynch <clears throat> and you haven't covered, you went to Deutsche and RBC, both yeah. on uh, trading, yeah, stats arbitrage and equity market neutral. I'll let you talk about that because I'm fascinated just in how how you kind of transitioned from Merrill Lynch and then kind of jumped into to Deutsche? Yeah, I mean, that would have been very unusual. Uh, but what happened is actually that, you know, uh, Merrill was undergoing a bit of a transformation. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Milam used to be, asset management used to be kind of a sleepy backwaters buried in within uh, private wealth as, as a cost center. Um, about the time that I showed up and they got serious about risk. And, you know, for I did actually do my risk job at first. I, I kind of built up risk for fixed income initially and then subsequently for equities, for um, AI, or they used to call AI, you'd call that alts now because, you know, don't confuse it with <laughs> artificial intelligence, but alternative investing was just starting to take off and hedge funds and how do you do risk for hedge funds. So I kind of, you know, had the, uh, good fortune of being nicely situated in the middle of all this. Uh, and for the roughly half a trillion of assets that Merrill was running, um, you know, I had the benefit of being involved in most of it, except for I didn't have anything to do with munis, but I did kind of get some exposure on how to, I mean, I actually built up the system for fixed income first and then later for equities and um, uh, certainly for all. So I had a pretty good, you know, bird's eye view of these different asset classes, how do they work from risk perspective. And in, in the late 90s, um, you know, there was a big change in leadership. They uh, got some dynamic new leadership uh, <clears throat> and uh, Bob Dahl showed up and, you know, uh, he was the new president and uh, <clears throat> CIO of, of uh, Merrill Lynch Asset Management before, uh, before it got acquired by BlackRock. Now, after the uh, merger it just became sort of you know BlackRock or acquisition I guess it wasn't merger uh, and and Bob stayed around as vice chairman but <clears throat> um, so once Bob took over as uh, as uh, president CIO of the firm uh, he decided you know he had been running funds before very successfully and he wanted to continue running them and he wanted to basically while running this gigantic company with you know uh, uh, half a trillion in assets, which I mean, uh, uh, back then, by the way, that was a lot. It, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It doesn't sound like a lot these days because I think BlackRock's running probably six trillion or something, but it it might have been the second or third largest by assets, but it was certainly one of the largest asset managers at the time. And you know, he wanted to run these um, various uh, funds on the side. Now, clearly. This is where the beauty of quant and the scalability of a quantum mental process comes into play, right? Because Bob is truly a visionary. He understood how to leverage quant. And, you know, there are people like that I've had the good fortune of working with, like Bob Dahl or later uh, Boaz Weinstein at, uh, at uh, Deutsche Bank, who were, you know, um, I mean, th there are the very geeky type of quants, your sort of super PhD type of guys who don't see the big picture and they just get so, you know, deep down in the weeds, uh, they never emerge, right? So, <laughs> um, but then it's it's always nice when, if you have in, in a senior management position, somebody who's sufficiently visionary to kind of understand, you know, how to leverage quant, right? Because again, mm -hmm. the, 
the early days when most people did not understand that, oh, well, you know, eventually all stock trading is going to be automated. So don't count on your upstairs uh, block trader, right? Like, I mean, uh, this was a very different time. Nobody thought that you would be trading stocks fully electronically, right? So nobody thought it was going to be all algo and uh, that even most of portfolio management active portfolio management would sort of head in the direction of where we are today, which is some combination of ETFs and, you know, uh, quant. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, Bob Bob was clearly uh, ahead of his times and I got drafted in that effort. So I was uh, able to launch a whole slew of uh, funds with uh, Bob Dahl in the late 90s, which later, uh, you know, because our timing was very good and we had enormous success in the early years. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what I mean by timing was very good. <clears throat> um, we got our actually, the assets of the fund went literally from 3 million in seed capital to uh, about 30 billion very quickly in a, uh, a few years. Um, now, <clears throat> the reason this happened is because uh, performance was extraordinary. And the reason that happened is because a, we were onto something in terms of factor investing, right? So we were the early folks. There were just a couple of uh, shops doing factor investing. There, 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 there was the AQR team that had just recently left uh, GSAM, and then there was a subsequent team <laughs> at GSAM that had taken over from them. And uh, then there was, uh, you know, the uh, group at BGI. So the original uh, uh, sort of, I guess, the, you know, the successors to the... Um, <clears throat> Um, whole kind of uh, West Coast uh, DNA of the Barra folks, the, you know, the ex-Barra folks and the and the uh, Wells Fargo uh, type of index, you know, the first index fund, all of those. But anyway, I mean, everybody knows BGI, right? Like very, very successful um, uh, shop in the quant factor investing space. So that's how small it was. There really weren't a lot of people doing it. I mean, now, now of course, most people know about growth and value and uh, momentum, but at the time, actually, most people did not. So Fama French was not really in the vernacular. It wasn't being taught. And most people coming out of business school probably didn't know or hadn't heard of Fama French. So it really was, the market was much less efficient. <clears throat> and as a result, we were able to beat, even in mutual fund 40 act format, I think we were beating uh, the, the indices uh, by a very handy margin, like 14, 15% annualized uh, the first five years of the fund uh, uh, till I left for Deutsche Bank. And, you know, that was pretty astonishing because in, in the mutual fund world, it's very unusual to beat the index by that kind of a margin annualized for any appreciable period of time. But this was, as I mentioned, uh, it was the confluence of, hey, this factor investing stuff is new. It's not been arbitraged. That was number one. So one big tailwind in our favor. But number two, um, which, which is uh, worth pointing out, is actually that, you know, um, when does factor investing work best or when does any kind of quant investing work well? It's when there is some reversion to value or some sort of, you know, thematic tailwind that's kind of helping you out. And as it turns out, shortly after we launched the, the funds, you know, uh, the NASDAQ bubble peaked. So if you had launched the fund a little earlier, like AQR did, you know, they, they uh, almost uh, didn't make it in the first 18 months. If you go back and look, I mean, AQR had a uh, uh, very tough time, I, I believe, uh, you know, in terms of drawdown and, uh, and their overall kind of prospects were looking pretty bleak because, you know, uh, they were doing the right thing and the smart thing, but, you know, the market was insane. The, the, the rational exuberance uh, that Greenspan talked of just continued um, up until the first quarter of, uh, of 2000. And so, you know, every day you'd wake up and these crazy Internet stocks like Yahoo would just go up even more. And so, you know, uh, most rational investors, whether quant or fundamental, we're really not doing too well. I mean, as you can imagine, you know, uh, if, if there's a few internet stocks that are driving all the gains, it's tough to, I mean, it was so bad that actually borrow retroactively tried to create a new internet factor because their, you know, their risk models were clearly not, you know, they were struggling to explain what was going on. So they just sort of came up with a fudge factor. <laughs> Let's call it the internet factor. <laughs> um, in any case, so that's that's uh, 
that's what really helped us, uh, you know, get on the map was because the NASDAQ bubble was deflating, factor investing was working really well, and we, we, we had the right strategy for the right time. So that worked pretty well, actually. Those were the golden years of Quant, I would say, from roughly uh, uh, Q1 of 2000 up until the uh, uh, Quant quake in August of 2007. Things worked extremely well for uh, this type of strategy. Uh, now, I should point out, because most people don't understand what's going on today, but um, you see, in, in, in a in a bear market, nobody really rings a bell at the top and says, hey, this is <laughs> not a bear market, right? But <laughs> if you look at what's happening today, I would be shocked if this is not a bear market. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's my personal opinion. But uh, in fact, I would be shocked if the Fed does manage to engineer a soft landing and we, we don't have some kind of a, I mean, regardless, whether we, whether we have a technical recession or not, it doesn't matter. But the point is that what we witnessed today is we've seen extraordinary factor returns, like triple digit returns to factor investing last year and this year, I might add. Um, we, we see our models already up 35% year to date. So on an annualized basis, again, the numbers are obscene. And the only time that we've seen this happen was during the NASDAQ crash when things were pretty crazy to start with. And then when you had a reversion to rationality, right? I mean, the value factor came roaring back. Well, guess what? It was exactly the same thing. I mean, up until the big inflection point three days after the election, right? So if you recall on 9th of November, 2020, uh, there was a massive resolution of uncertainty. Um, the elections had just gotten over and then um, Pfizer lit the match on the dry sort of uh, tinder because they announced the vaccine on the 9th of November. And then everything went ballistic. So in one day, we had the largest crash in the momentum factor in, in the history of the momentum factor. It was down over 20% on the 9th of November. And uh, value simultaneously had a massive uh, comeback. So now anecdotally, people who don't follow factors just looked at the screen and said, oh, my goodness, what's going on? The airlines are up and cruise lines are up and, you know, all the fang names are down. And then, of course, they thought about it and said, yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, you got a vaccine. So I guess that's why the airlines and cruise lines are up. Right. I mean, uh, but the truth is you got to look at not the stories and the anecdotal stuff, you, you know, like, oh, airlines are up and, you know, and uh, fang is down. But what does that correspond to? That corresponds to a huge reversal in the momentum factor. Okay, that's what was really going on. And simultaneously, value was coming back. All of your financials and not quite energy that took a bit longer, but um, that's what it really turned. And value has been on a tremendous run ever since November of 2020. Um, uh, and but if you go back and roll the tape on what every you know pundit was saying on on CNBC, uh, <clears throat> most of them had declared value was dead. And, you know, these growth stocks uh, were going to rule the world and it was just going to be fang and uh, that's it, right? So you, you, th these are very predictable kind of uh, uh, cyclical occurrences, but it was a little bit like the whole nif nifty 50 type of thing, right? Where there was just this massive concentration of wealth and uh, stock returns were highly concentrated in these few names. Right. Very much like the nifty 50, except even more concentrated, just a yeah. fact. Yeah. <laughs> so um, basically, you got a few names, a few stocks that became trillion dollars capitalizations. Right. And 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 that's why it actually it's even harder for active managers to beat the index, because unless you just bet on a few of those names. The rest of the index was not really <laughs> doing that well. So, yeah. yeah, similar to that tech bubble back in the early 2000s where you saw it. Few of those big tech stocks just kind of dominating the market. Yeah, so it, it's it's very similar in some respects, but now of course you've got all these other cross currents, you know, with the geopolitics and mm -hmm. you know, the inflation genies out of the bottle and Fed's boxed into a corner, so they have to hike. And yet we are looking at a second derivative issue with you know uh, slowdown and this and that. So I think uh, uh, we're in for a very interesting year. Absolutely, but uh, I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> why, don't, why don't you talk a little bit about quantum mental here? So this is probably the hardest question I have to answer when students ask, because for me, it's just this really bleeding of you have finance on one side, you have pure quant on the other side. 
and you have quantum mental somewhat in the middle. And it's hard to define, I guess, that transition between them, but you're obviously an expert in this area. How would you really nail down quantum mental as a, a strategy or kind of an idea or a train of thought? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, so look, I mean, uh, over time, um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, all of this stuff is going to, you know, I don't think that there's going to be any pure fundamental managers left over time. Sort of the asymptotic direction is that everything's going to be either quantum mental or pure quant, right? Right. So, uh, e- even the most fundamental PMs and seat in the pants kind of hedge funds today rely pretty substantially on all data. So you 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 were there at my quaff few with uh, you know our friend Tony Berkman, another Carnegie Mellon guy, um, and you know the, he was one of the early guys in the space with Majestic, and now there's um, lots of companies that are doing all you know that are sort of uh, mining the exhaust data from uh, all walks of life, whether it's retail footfall or geospatial or this or that, right? So there's all of this all data that that even fundamental PMs who, who don't use quant for other, you know, cr- crucial decision-making, like I guess the big difference between fundamental PMs and quant is at a baseline level, they don't use an optimizer, right? So they don't use a systematic process to decide what should my, pos- uh, should, what, what should my sizing of the portfolio be, right? Should I have 2% of this name and five of that, or, you know, that, we use an optimizer. They don't do that. That's one big difference. Okay. Um, so uh, in, in terms of portfolio metrics and factor exposures and common factor versus idio and all those type of things, right? That's where the science, the portfolio science comes in. And that's where the, the quants usually add the most value. Because let's put it this way. Even if I had no source of alpha, right? Like even if I don't have any great insights, which the evidence would suggest most managers don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Just the, just the fact that you can use uh, the latest uh, technology to do better portfolio construction and risk management and kind of, you know, smooth out the drawdowns means that you're going to, you know, boost your sharp and certina, right? So from a risk adjusted standpoint, the quants tend to you always win, at least in the denominator, because they can manage the risk much better than fundamental. I think that much uh, most people will grant us, right? That uh, the quants have, well, it's their job to study the science of how do you do this in a systematic manner? What's the right, you know, how tight should your sector industry, single stock, constraints be, factory exposures, this and that. Now, traditionally, the problem with fund, pure fundamental PMs has been that, you know, uh, I mean, everybody looks smart in the way up, but if you don't ask the tough questions about what we exposures, what constraints do you have, and why do you have so much of, you know, Netflix or whatever it is that, well, everybody looks like a genius till they don't. And mm-hmm. then it's too late, right? I mean, if Netflix is down 35% and, you know, Bill Ackman had too much of it, did, did his investors ask him if he had an optimizer? I mean, like, how did he decide his portfolio? You know, I mean, this is, I mean, by the way, Bill Ackman's blown up a few funds before. So but his investors clearly don't seem to care about his sharp ratio. <laughs> so that, that's on the investors. That's that, <laughs> you know, um, so that's the biggest difference, obviously, the portfolio construction aspect. And uh, do you uh, did, did you use an optimizer? What 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 was the science behind that? You know that that thought process. However, what I'm actually suggesting is that the the convergence is really taking place on the alpha side, right? So it used to be that maybe. Uh, a Peter Lynch would, you know, look at the Wall Street Journal and say, oh, well, I like Procter & Gamble because, you know, <laughs> right, like the whole Buffett type of methodology, you, you invest in the companies you're familiar with and you look at whatever, you know, his favorite metric, I don't, you know, maybe somebody looks at free cash flow yield. I mean, Buffett's actually, if you think about it, you can do a factor analysis of Buffett's methodology and figure out, okay, maybe Buffett's kind of a Q Garp guy. I mean, that, that would be my guess, right? So you can try to... Yeah these some combination of quality and you know uh, growth at reasonable price or I mean whatever it is I mean it's easy to we, we we actually I mean you can always go back and just sort of do the sharp 92 type of style analysis uh, even for uh, long short funds you know I mean we've, we've done that with our uh, smart betas so um, it's definitely possible to tease out what anybody's style is and then you can really try to figure out okay does 
Buffett or Mr. Ackman or anybody else actually add any value mm-hmm. in excess of those uh, of their dynamic stat exposure. So if you if you did the sort of rolling style based on the sharp 92 type of approach, right? And let's say we, we do it with our smart betas and A, it confirms the uh, posture of the manager if they claim to be a large cap value fund and they actually have exposure to large cap and value. <laughs> I mean, that's always useful to know. But B, um, could you have done better if I just gave you, you know, I mean, by the way, th- that's the whole mission statement of my, I'm sort of talking my book here with the FinTech with my uh, quantity machine intelligence technologies. But um, we, what we set out to do with this new entity was to say, hey, I've, I've been running market neutral and standard for quite a while now. Um, for over 20 years, I've been in the factor investing space. Um, can we take those juice it up, right? Like with machine learning, right? So that's sort of the latest iteration of this stuff is, okay, if we do this right and we can figure out how to do it differently, maybe we come up with a new growth and value that's really machine learning enhanced and it doesn't look anything like your father's growth and value. And that's kind of what we're um, claiming. Um, And then the question becomes, well, so now if you're sort of factor proxies, your smart betas are really that smart or that high octane, then presumably just taking some linear combination and putting just forgetting, you know, derivatives for a second, right? Because that can also be done with, as you know, you've done, you've proved all those theorems with uh, dynamic hedging. And so you know that, you know, you, you don't really need the derivatives are dispensable, right? So the point is, if you can use these smart betas to express any linear view on equities, right? Like basically you can replicate the profile of any uh, equity fundamental PM like Valmo, Rothmo, you know, Garb, QGarb, uh, Quolmo. I mean, then what's left? What is left? That's what every fundamental PM does. I've never met a fundamental PM who does anything different. That's what, they, that's what every mutual fund does. So if you were to strip out the conflicts of interest in the system on how brokers get paid and how you know, the system is structured, I mean, in terms of you know, the, the vested interest, then logically, most of these mutual funds should not exist because all of that can be replicated quite easily with you know, these type of uh, risk premium exposure or factor exposures, if you will. And I would argue that even certain hedge funds, which I will not name, um, uh, certain well-known funds that charge two and twenty for uh, doing a terrible job of, you know, uh, providing factor or risk premium exposure, that can also be disintermediated, right? Because if you're if you're Calpers or Yale and Diamond, right, the question is why should you pay uh, two and twenty type of hedge fund fees if the vast majority, and this is where you have to convince yourself, but our, our claim is that pretty much any manager in the equity space, and you can extrapolate to other asset classes as well, because factor investing is can be extended to them. Um, but in the equity space, which is what I do, it's very clear at this point that um, almost any strategy can be replicated with these factors, right? Uh, I mean, we've even managed to do it for event driven stuff like uh, speculating on LBOs. So you, you can do extremely well uh, on, on things like, uh, you know, event risk like LBOs. So you, you could say, well, maybe there's some little niches left like special sits and this and that. But no, I mean, even, even those type of things, you can, you know, kind of automate exposures to, um, you know, to risk carb or, or, or um, LBO, which is more sort of uh, before the deal and, and that, that sort of thing, right? But all the traditional factor stuff where we, we said, okay, you got the Fama French and then along came, you know, uh, Carhartt and Novi Marks and well, there was always uh, Jagdish Titman was already there from 93 or something. Um, so the, the, those were the standard sort of uh, references in the literature, right? And that's how th- this whole thing came about is that basically uh, the academics uh, identified a bunch of anomalies and, and hedge funds jumped all over them and most of them got ARBed. So most of the well-known factors don't work anymore, right? So the evidence is very clear. The well-known factors, the papers that were published long ago, like Jagdish Titman, those type of uh, well-known, uh, you know, uh, factors uh, have been completely arbitraged. So, uh, but lots of other anomalies have been found and there've been attempts to kind of tame the factor zoo and you've got this enormous sort of zoo of hundreds of factors. And you said, well, it depends on how you tame it. 
can you do it better with some of these newfangled machine learning methods? Can you figure out a better combination that would perhaps outperform? And so uh, in any case, to get back to the point of, you know, and I, I guess I've sort of now uh, inserted myself into this uh, debate and active versus passive, but where I'm really going is that, you know, my, my guess is that the world sort of, we're, we're, we're heading towards this uh, um, world of quantum mental, which is going to be your, quasi-passive investments, because there really won't be too much that's completely active, right? Because, I mean, your audience, the investing audience won't let you run anything seat of the pants anymore, right? Everybody wants right. to, I mean, it, it doesn't matter who you are, how famous you are, but when you go to the investment committee at, uh, uh, you know, at a large pension or endowment, they want to see some semblance of due process. What is the right. process? What's your style? What box do we pigeonhole you into? You can't just be anything anywhere, right? Like that doesn't work anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's some of my thoughts on that. As I'm looking at it, trying to dissect it is, it does seem like fundamentals basically being enhanced. I guess you could look at it coming from one side or you could look at it from the other side of quantum mentals, basically replacing, you know, fundamental investing. Right. Exactly. Oh. That's what's happened. Because, I mean, the smart fundamental guys who wanted to survive or get ahead of the curve, what they did is they they tried to incorporate our type of alphas. They said, hey, I don't need to read the Wall Street Journal every day. I don't need to follow every, you know, earnings call and, and talk to management and kick the tires because actually I can just get a rank of alphas from, you know, Quancy or some other place or, you know, large firms now have huge internal teams doing things of this nature, right? Mm -hmm. So they can, as a starting point, they can get these alphas that say, okay, on a relative value basis, you know, what's the parent's trade? Is GM better than Ford? Is Tata better than Toyota, right? That type of relative value judgment on hundreds of these factors and then some combo metric, right? Like, so if you said, okay, you, you're, you're sort of a Buffett disciple and let's just pretend that, you know, you're um, uh, one of those guys who believes in some combination of uh, um, quality plus uh, growth at reasonable price. Now, why on earth would you be doing all this um, stuff manually, right? It's very inefficient. You, you, mm -hmm. you need a team of 50 analysts, but that's how the old mutual funds used to do it. They would have enormous teams and all these guys doing stuff manually by hand, reading the journal and, you know, putting numbers in the spreadsheet and <laughs> building uh, bottom up by hand DCF model. And, and by the way, I uh, might add making lots of mistakes along the way. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because the moment you have a huge army of these analysts were all not very quant, right? They're MBAs. They're, they're all doing ad hoc stuff. Like somebody's building their own DCF model with one set of assumptions. Somebody else is doing totally different. And, you know, yeah. I mean, that's how you uh, end up with, you know, forecasts of, right. I mean, is Tesla going to be 5,000 or <laughs> five bucks? In those? But, you know, people come up with all sorts of uh, forecasts, right? Now, <clears throat> The, what I'm trying to suggest is that it, it, it logically what you would expect to see happen is that over time, people realize that actually, guys, stop wasting your time. Don't do these silly models. There's, there's, no, there's no real edge in every analyst, and every portfolio manager trying to do these very detailed models and huge. No, what they should do is just take the quant input as a starting point. Here's the alpha that describes your philosophy. Mm -hmm. If you're GARP, he has a GARP alpha. If you're deep value, he has, he has, you know, he has a, a, a ranking that corresponds to deep value, right? Or a forecast, whether it's uh, Z scores or, um, or just percentiles or some kind of a expect return forecast based on that. That should be the starting point. And then, you know, the job of the portfolio manager kind of transmogrifies into becoming more of a maestro. They're now the orchestra conductor, right? So the, the point I'm trying to get to is that they should be timing and tilting and, you know, and conducting the orchestra. Mm -hmm. This instrument, that. But you, you shouldn't be in the business of reinventing the piano or the, you know, the violin. That's silly, right? So the, the whole, I think the days of every uh, little fun trying to do everything organically and, oh, it's very proprietary. I, I think people are starting to get to the point, especially with all data, they realize that's completely misguided, right? Because everybody used to think that everything had to be proprietary. And then they realize, oh, wait a second, it's very proprietary, but we have no edge. 
because everybody else is doing the same proprietary stuff. Like everybody else is doing their own proprietary value and I have no edge. You've been like, whoa, 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 what do you mean? All the value managers are underperforming? Yes, because it's called common factor risk. So, you know, um, I mean, that clearly is not the differentiator, right? I mean, if you can have an extended period of many years when the vast majority of value managers dramatically, dramatically underperformed and very well-known quant shops included, uh, you know, uh, massively underperformed, then you really have to question the uh, raison d'etre for such funds and, and you know, what, what's the, what are we trying to do here? Um, but, you know, I mean, all data gave people some hope and clearly some hedge funds uh, who were early uh, in, in, in that effort have managed to monetize it well to their credit. And not surprisingly, many of them have been quant folks that have, uh, um, it clearly lends itself to that. But there are fundamental shops that have really, and that's where, again, I meant the quantumental aspect that, you know, the, the fundamental PMs that embraced all data and other types of quant inputs and really leveraged it, you know, really benefited because they were able to generate the earning surprise, right? They were able to see the geospatial and the retail footfall and look at the IoT data, the credit card uh, numbers and say, oh, well, should I be betting on, you know, JC Penny against uh, Macy's or the other way around? I right. Mean, I mean, we, we've actually found, by the way, for stuff like retail, I mean, we've found that even without all the fancy and clearly in retail, you know, these type of all data uh, metrics work pretty well because, I mean, it stands to reason, right? Like you just try and forecast the quarterly sales, which is going to be very highly correlated to, I mean, Cedarus Paribus, that's your earning surprise. If you can figure out the revenue surprise, then, you know, Cedarus Paribus, that, that, that gives you the answer. So it, 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 that's a pretty direct line between forecasting that number and whatever edge the alt data is giving you. But surprisingly, I mean, we found that with the machine learning enhancements, even traditional factor stuff actually still works very well. I mean, we, 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 you know, our model has been able to do very well recently just based on analyst revisions, right? Good old earnings surprise, who scores diffusion metrics, all that type of stuff for earnings or revenues or, I mean, that's without all data, just just traditional factor stuff. It still works, still works very well, especially on, on the short side, when if you look at the current environment where finally, uh, you know, stocks that miss are being really punished. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if your earning surprise model can pick up on things like Netflix, then, you know, at least get you out of the name or, you know, Facebook was a nice example last quarter where a simple earning surprise model, actually, we, we, we saw it coming, but, you know, surprisingly, a lot of folks didn't. Uh, um, so again, that's the beauty of quant and not, not to, you know, not to pick on Bill Ackman, but, you know, he's a public figure, so it's, it's fair game. Um, <laughs> the point is, like, you know, somewhere, if, if you remember the infamous Herbalife trade, right, he, he was on the wrong side of Herbalife. And if, if I remember, I, and again, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but whatever the number was, a very large uh, uh, loss on a single name, which, of course, in a quant portfolio would be, un, uh, you know, unimaginable. Um, <laughs> had he just looked at a, another source of information, because, I mean, on the stat, in the stat our world, in, in our models, we were, for the most part, on the opposite side of the trade. We were just looking at it saying, well, what is he saying that we, <laughs> you know, the quant model is seeing the exact opposite. Why is this guy betting the normal life? <laughs> mm. Yeah, definitely. A, I think an ever-changing world now is quants kind of become a lot more mainstream in the modern times. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about here, kind of the last topic here to wrap up this podcast. Let's talk about this club you're kind of working with, you've started, you're running here in New York City. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. So, I mean, you know, look, uh, uh, New is a nonprofit, first of all. So it's just, uh, it's a hobby. It's a, you know, it's a labor of love for all of us that are involved and we're fortunate to have uh, some good people from the various quant programs uh, that volunteer their time and volunteer as well. Um, I, I took over what used to be called Quaffa Few, and that organization had actually been around for quite a while, for over three decades, as uh, kind of a you know 
I mean, at a base level, it's just a drinking club, right? I mean, quaffing a few. And but the the whole point was that it's a social uh, venue after hours when you don't come in a you know uh, professional capacity or not representing your firm. You don't have to worry about uh, firm affiliations and what you say on record or off. It was very informal. We just hang out and have a drink. You know, you listen to some cutting edge research and some. Uh, distinguished speakers. And as you can see from our, you know, uh, online presence, we've certainly had a lot of them. We've, we've been fortunate to have uh, uh, great uh, folks like Peter Carr and, and uh, Emmanuel Derman and uh, um, so many great speakers. My my classmate Uwe Wishtip and Professor Shreve and uh, more recently, uh, well, we, we've had a bunch of book launches. We had, you know, Greg Zuckerman uh, talking about his book on uh, Jim Simons and more recently even about the vaccine. Um, and we're going to have actually this lady who just put out a book on Bill Gross on PIMCO. That's going to be an exciting one. So we do some book launches. Those are cool. People like that. And they, they want to get the book signed and, you know, <laughs> talk to the author. That's kind of neat. Uh, but, you know, on the geekier side, I mean, you know, I think for Quant's just the opportunity to sort of hear from uh, somebody like a uh, uh, somebody of the caliber of Derman uh, and, you know, be, be able to just network uh, with them or their industry peers, that's kind of a nice thing in a very informal setting. So that's the beauty of the club. I mean, when I took over, when I was elected president, unfortunately, uh, things had gotten, you know, the, uh, <laughs> it had really gone south, the old quaff a few, there was a toxic sort of culture that had developed and there was a bit of a quaff a feud going on between the folks that ran it previously. So we, uh, my, my first job in hand was to actually blow it up and say, okay, we're just going to, all this thing because this brand has now been tarnished and unfortunately it's become totally dysfunctional. So we actually uh, dissolved the old Quaff a few and that's why we started Quaff a new. <laughs> and you know the little X in there actually kind of symbolically uh, means the exponential X like in TEDx. So you know how they, they do the TEDx talk. So you've got the Quaffa X new, which is pronounced Quaffa new, but it means Quaffa with the exponential possibilities for New York, new beginnings, potentially other chapters. That's what we were initially thinking, but with COVID, we ended up having members internationally anyway. So people started logging in from California and from Singapore and, you know, in Germany. So we even had uh, some international speakers. So that was kind of a nice thing about COVID is that, A, we didn't miss a beat. We just kept going, um, you know, online and B, we managed to attract some talent, uh, great speakers from Europe and other places. And so that was pretty neat, too. But let's let's see. I mean, you know, we're back live now. I hope that it's becoming going from pandemic to endemic so we can uh, continue to do these uh, live events without too many waves. <laughs> I'd love to have folks like you and your uh, and your followers uh, attend. I mean, we've, we've uh, got a sponsor now, which allows us to make the events free. We welcome any other sponsors who want to, you know, I mean, with the live events, we need separate sponsors for drinks, et cetera. But um, the nice thing is at present, we uh, have been able to make it completely free for all students and quants. And that was always my objective. You know, we, we don't want any barriers to knowledge. So mm -hmm. any student from any quant program wants to dial in and just listen to, you know, to Durbin talking about derivatives or, or, or uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, the new book and Bill Gross or something. We'd love to have all of those people in the <laughs> just have a very dynamic kind of uh, collegiate environment where people get to have that interaction. I mean, I think it's great for students because, uh, you know, they also uh, kind of get to informally network for jobs. Um, it's much better to meet somebody in an informal setting over a drink and just get to know them and they might actually reach out to you themselves if they like you. You know, it's very different than going to HR and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going through that process. <laughs> yeah, I had a blast at the last one. Uh, a few students recognized me and you know messaged me on the the chat and said, "Hey, I'm shocked to see you here." And did a little networking with them as well, which was nice. Uh, do you guys plan on doing more of those kind of virtual ones where they're online? Well, um, so uh, we we may go back, like like I said, depending on. Um, what happens with the pandemic? It, it all depends, right? I mean, let's see what happens as the fall and winter comes, if it picks up again. Um, I hope not, but we would love to continue with the live events. So we have that sort of energy here with the old New York kind of uh, 
crew, but we, we want to keep the online participation going as well. Uh, that's nice to have. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, we've had thoughts about, I mean, uh, kind of uh, better uh, ma making the content and stuff more accessible and helping people, but we really don't, I mean, because it's a volunteer thing, you know, and people do the best they can. So I'm sure we could do a better job, but we, we already post all the lectures and PDFs that that people approve and some don't um, because of firm, uh, uh, you know, compliance sort of considerations. But like to the extent that most speakers do actually uh, don't have an issue with their content being online so that it's it's all out there for free. Anyone can look it up. And uh, I think you can actually play most of the old uh, lectures as well. I don't, I don't remember. I, I believe what happened is we ran out of space, so we had to do a YouTube channel. I think you had to put uh, some students <laughs> to. We're, we're not competing with you, by the way. Don't <laughs> you can, we can affiliate with you. Oh, no worries. I'll definitely link you below as well because I think somebody messaged me and asked. They said this was like great content. It was like industry leaders they said I learned so much. You know of any other like organizations doing this? And I'm like, no. This is the only one I've ever heard of, and I just got invited. So. You know, definitely a, a great source of information and networking and kind of a good, I guess, quant, quant realm to kind of hang out in. So more the merrier. I mean, we want knowledge to be free. Um, yeah, it's it's a great thing in the age of Coursera, right? So there was uh, there was actually a, a, an undergrad at Carnegie Mellon my time who was uh, actually, interestingly, he was TAing one of the computational finance courses. And I Ask the dean. This is very unusual. You re you realize that there are you know uh, PhDs and former faculty who are sitting in the class, and you've got a you've got an undergraduate uh, 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 TAing this course. Some of them may be offended. Uh, anyway, um, turns out that guy's name is uh, Andrew Eng. So that's oh. that guy who started Coursera, <laughs> and of course he's well known now in the deep learning world. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty big name. So. Anyway, it was not a random undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Melinda, it was great having you on the podcast. Love to have you back anytime to talk about, you know, fundamentals or investing or anything like that. So thank you for coming on. Uh, absolutely. Uh, my, my pleasure and all, all the best uh, with your initiative. I'm glad that you're doing this for the quant world. It's, it's great to have a community. Quants are not that good at uh, socializing. They need a nudge. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Perfect. Cheers. Good night.